I welcome you here again tonight to Victory Baptist Church, and we're glad that you've chosen to uh, come to our Wednesday night Bible study on Facebook. Hopefully you have your Bibles with you, and we're going to continue on with our series on what happens when a believer dies. I know that uh, this week's been a tragic week for many, and many have lost loved ones, and so I hope that the message tonight will be one of encouragement and one of hope. And so let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we come before you now, and Father, we just thank you that we have an opportunity to gather here, Father, and to just study your word together, God, because we know your word's truth, and too often times in this world, and so oftentimes, God, we place our hopes in the things of this world, the things that are temporal, not eternal, things that don't last, things that, that thieves can steal, and, and corrosion can corrode, and, and rust can take over, and yet, Father, we don't invest our time and our talents and all the things you'd have for us in, in eternity. God, I pray you'd tilt our head a bit and help us to see that, God, the most important things that we do in this lifetime are the things that are eternal. And Father, as we come before you tonight, we pray that, Lord Jesus, for everyone that has lost a loved one this week, or God, that those that are battling sickness and those that are battling COVID, God, we pray for them. We pray that, that Lord, you'd strengthen them through this time. And that, God, you would uh, just anoint this Bible study that we're having tonight. Would you use it for your honor, glory, and kingdom's sake? In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to suppose that you're on your deathbed and you can feel your heart pounding in your body and you know that death is imminent. I wonder what it would be like. I wonder what it will be like at that moment. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27, it says, that it is appointed unto man to wants to die, and then the judgment. The NIV in Hebrews, chapter 9, 27, reads it just a little bit differently. It says that just as people are destined to die once, and after that, face judgment. Today, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about unbelievers. But what I want to do is I want to give you hope. I want you to have hope because the life that you're living right now, with its troubles and its sorrows, it's not going to last forever. This life is short, and most of the time it's full of sorrow and, and pain. And if you're not facing sorrow and pain now, it's just over the horizon. It'll come again. And I don't mean to be pessimistic, but you're not meant for this world. You're aliens here. And if you are a believer, if you're a born-again believer in Christ and you've entrusted your heart and your life to Christ, there's going to come a time when Jesus promises that he's going to come again. Now, whether that means to come again uh, in the air and that you are alive and raptured up, or whether that means that he comes to you through the door of death, we're all going to stand before him. We have a date with destiny, and we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to be in his presence. And as I read the scriptures tonight, I want to try to tell you what the Bible says is going to happen as, you're, as you go through this time of transition. It first of all tells us that in Luke chapter 16, verse 22, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now, the first thing that's going to happen when a person dies is that they're going to enter into the angels are going to carry them to what we may call heaven, or in this play, in this passage that we read, it's called Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. Some people may call it paradise. The Bible has different names for it. But basically what's happened here is that you will see an angel, and that angel will escort you to the presence of God, whatever you may call that. And so what happens is, is that once your heart stops beating, then no longer does oxygen flow to the muscles and the organs of your body. And at that point, your body rigor mortis begins to set in, and your organs and your muscles begin to, to decay and to begin to deteriorate and to die because they're deprived of this life-giving oxygen. And soon your brain waves will cease, and at that moment, the doctor is going to pronounce you dead. But even though the doctor pronounces you dead, at that moment, if you're a born-again believer, according to the Word of God, you're going to be more alive than you have ever been. 
suddenly you're going to have a higher conscience. And your soul, the Bible teaches, is going to be separated from your body. Sort of like the mother giving physical birth to a baby, your physical body is going to give birth to your soul. The soul is going to be stripped away from the body. It's going to be separated. And suddenly as you're in that room where you died or whether you're on an accident scene or whether you're in your home just having a heart attack, when that moment happens, your spiritual eyes are going to be open. And you're going to suddenly be able to see a world that may have been there that you weren't quite aware of. And in that room, you're going to see angelic beings. Those angelic beings you may have may be familiar to you. They may have been around most of your life even though you never saw them. But you sensed them. You felt them watching you. Maybe at times you felt their guiding hand. Maybe at times you felt their rescue when you came near death from an accident, when you almost fell asleep at the wheel of a car. But at that moment, they're going to be very familiar to you. And you are definitely going to be very familiar to them. I can imagine that maybe they will call your name and they will say, you need to come with me because I have a place now for you to go. And at that moment, these angels are going to escort you into the presence of God. Now, when I think of being in the actual presence of an all-holy God today, there's a lot of fear. And the Bible describes people who were taken or the presence of God appearing to people who were in the flesh. And it talks about the fear that they had. It talks about the, angel, about the angels appearing and the glory of God showing round about these angels, this glory of God, this presence of God in a field where shepherds were watching over the flock. And the Bible says that they were so afraid. It talks about the presence of God being in the temple. When Isaiah saw the presence of God, like a cloud with angels all around. And at that moment, Isaiah said, Woe is to me. I'm an unclean man, living among an unclean people with unclean lips. And even John, the disciple of Jesus, was taken into heaven one day through a revelation. And while he was there, he saw Jesus. And at that moment, Jesus was so holy that John describes that scene as I fell at his feet as if dead. You see, right now we may say, this is what I'm going to ask God when I get there, and this is what I would say to God. And when I think of that in fleshly terms, I, I know that we don't know what we're talking about if we say something like that. Because God is so holy, and we are so sinful. And we could not even abide in the presence of God for one moment if it weren't for the blood of Jesus and what Jesus did for us upon the cross. Because we are so sinful. And sin is immediately destroyed in the presence of God. But this time, as you're ushered into the presence of God, there will be no more fear. For the Bible says in the book of Exodus that no man can see God and live. But this time, it will not be your fleshly body that's alive. It will be your spiritual body that's alive. And there'll be no more fear. And I wonder, how could I be in the presence of God and there'd be no fear? Well, the Bible tells us, or I think it teaches us, that first of all, it's going to be by our faith that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. It's because we trust Him. You see, I don't just trust that God's going to take me to heaven. We have to also trust that God's a loving God. I think that's the good news, isn't it? That God loves us in spite of us. That for God so loved the world that even before we were saved, God was loving us, even if we didn't love him. And we can reject him all the way to hell. But God loves us. And my faith and trust is that I serve a loving God, not a God that's looking at any moment to put someone in hell. But a God that loves me, even when I fail and even when I fall. Not that that gives me an excuse but it gives me his grace and I understand his grace. And so when we stand in the presence of God, this time there will be no fear because of our faith. But also I think it's because of the countenance of the very angels that are escorting us. Like I said, there'll be a familiarity. Isn't it great that uh, according to the scripture anyway, that when you die, you're not just going to walk into the presence of God alone. I don't know if you have a guardian angel or not. I mean, I can't prove that scripturally that there's an angel appointed just to watch over you as a believer. I don't know. If the day you were born again and 
And one of the angels of God would say, hey, you've got to watch over this guy. I don't know if that's the case or not. But I do know that angels will escort you into the presence of God. And I know that angels are alive and well on planet Earth this day, going about doing what God has asked them to do and upholding and encouraging and rescuing people, humankind, that God still so loves. So I believe the countenance of the angels and just the way that, you know, have you ever been in a place where maybe you went to a doctor's office and you were afraid? You're afraid of what the diagnosis may be? And yet the nurse there and the doctors there were uh, had such a countenance and a concern that immediately your mind and heart was set at peace. I believe that this will happen even twofold, threefold, when the angels, when you see these angels appear. You're not walking into the presence of God alone. You have the mighty angels of God that are escorting you there. And I also believe that once you step outside the body, of your physical body through death, that there's going to be a peace and a love that blankets uh, that blankets blankets us. You know, um, I was watching recently on a television show about near death experiences, and of many of these people, the the thing that they told that seemed that they seemed to have in common was they had no longer a fear of death because once they had stepped outside of the body, even there for that briefest moment. There was such a peace and there was such a love that they could not describe. So the angels of God are going to escort you into the, the presence of God. And I can imagine as you step outside that body and that you see those angels and as, as they begin to escort you toward God, I can imagine that there is some kind of light. And we've heard many accounts of near-death experiences where people have stepped outside the body or people who have died physically and were brought back. And they describe this, this light, this brilliant light. Well, I can imagine as we begin to walk toward that light, maybe that's what it's like. And as you near that light, suddenly this light seems to flow through you, warming your soul, giving you more and more life as you get nearer and nearer to that life, to that light. The old man is being stripped away. The old person that you used to be is now gone. And this light is flowing through you and it's changing you. And it's, and it's the mortal body is now taking upon itself immortality. The corruptible body is now becoming incorruptible. And the Bible teaches us that this all will occur in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. Now, a twinkle of an eye is not even a blink. It's just like if you have an idea and suddenly your eye just changes instantaneously that's how quickly your body's going to be changed from a physical body to a spiritual body and this spiritual body will have some resemblance to your physical body the bible teaches us that and it teaches that when i look at the resurrection of jesus because it says we will have a resurrected body and our body will be like his body the the disciples at first when they first saw him they didn't really recognize him but they did and as he drew nearer, like with Thomas, for example, Thomas saw him and he was, so, he was different, so different that Thomas said, I can't believe it's you unless I touch the, 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 the nail scarred hands. And so Jesus held out his hands and he showed the scars, the nail scarred hands. And so there's some familiarity to this body, but it's not the same body. This body is, will not age. This body has no more aches or no more groans. This body will never grow weary. This body will uh, be resurrected and eternal. But not only we have a new spiritual body, but you'll also have a new spiritual mind. It's a mind now that is enlightened, a higher consciousness, where you can now truly comprehend what truth is where you can know things, retain things, remember things. Uh, you, you'll know what truth is. You'll know the truth. You'll know righteousness. You'll know what real righteousness is. You'll know what real holiness is. You'll know what real justice is. It's no longer hindered by our views of sin. And sometimes our views of sin are, are, are very myopic and sometimes they're very distorted. But in this case, 
we will see it as it is. We will see how sin hurts God and we will understand fully how sin hurts God and how sin separated us from God and how sin destroyed many of our, our lives and a lot of our potential. We can understand those things no longer hindered by sin, no longer corrupted. And not only that, not only we have a new spiritual body and an enlightened spiritual mind, but we will have a spirit that sets free. It's set free. You know, most of us today live in some sort of shame and some sort of sort of guilt. But here, like in the garden, God created Adam and Eve naked in the garden. But after they sinned, they covered themselves up with fig leaves. Remember that scripture? And so we try to cover ourselves up with man-made stuff. You know, we put this best image forward. We don't want people to really know who we really are. We don't want to be intimate, even with God, a lot of times. We try to hide from God, like Adam and Eve hid themselves among trees. We know what that's like, because we try to ignore that God knows what we're doing, or God knows what we're sinning, or God knows what our strongholds are, or God knows our failing and fallings. And yet, here, we will be exposed. We, we will know and recognize immediately that God knows, and that God loves us anyway, truly loves us. And suddenly there'll be no more shame. There'll be no more need to cover up. You'll, you, you will have no more lies. You'll be free. You'll be fully realized. You will, you will know that, that God loves you and your spirit will be free and you'll be free of shame. You'll be free of guilt. You'll be free of condemnation because even though you are exposed, you know that God knows why you did what you did and the choices that you made. And God knows your heart. And God has, has saved you through the blood of Jesus Christ. And at that moment, your joy will be unspeakable. And the peace that you have in your soul will be perfect. And the love that you feel that surrounds you will be undeniable. And it will be unconditional. The Bible also teaches us that we'll be able to recognize and communicate with other believers who went on before us. Suddenly, we'll see our son again who died, tragically. We didn't understand why, why it happened. We got angry. We blamed God. In our enlightened mind, suddenly we'll understand. We will see God's plan and how God worked, and we'll be able to comprehend it. We'll be able to comprehend his truth and his justice, as I said. We'll finally be able to see that husband that went on, that believing husband, that believing wife, that grandma or grandpa, that mom or that dad, that brother or sister. We'll see some of the old folks from church, you know, who, who discipled us and who loved us. And we'll have all eternity to reunite. As I've said in the last couple of messages, you know, there's a song that says, I just want to see Jesus. Talk about when I get to heaven. I just want to see Jesus. But, you know, I have a feeling that, that God knows your heart. There's some other folks you'd really like to see, wouldn't you? Other folks that went on before you. And we'll sing when we all get to heaven, man. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. And you will sing with a multitude. You will join hands with the generations of ancestors you had. You'll sing with the angels. And you will shout and you will dance. Because now for the first time you will truly understand what Jesus has done for you. You will understand that heaven is yours because Christ paved the way by going to the cross and dying in your place and dying for your sin. You will understand it completely. And you will experience at that moment an overwhelming sense of gratitude for what God has done. And when you experience that over sense, uh, overwhelming sense of gratitude, then you will immediately have overpowering worship. It will throw you to your knees. Because you will understand that God loved you and that he went to the cross just for you. And he died. If you were the only person to ever come to Christ, he would have went to the cross and he would have died in your place. You couldn't help. You cannot help. But join in with the angels and the ancestors and fall on your knees and cry holy and holy and clap your hands and sing glory as it says in the book of Revelation, glory to the Son of God, the Lamb that taketh away 
the sin of the world. How beautiful that day is going to be. How great is your hope that one day we'll be able to worship with our ancestors and with, with, with our families that, who are believers, and we'll be able to worship with all those who have went on before us. And we'll be able to worship with all the mighty angels of God. And we'll be able to just shout and scream, glory, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for loving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't. I was a sinner. Most of my life, I lived my life any way I wanted to. I did what I wanted to do as, as long as I wanted to do it. And I failed so much. I was so much unlike Jesus. I, I was so much unlike what God wanted me to be. I, I spent most of my life in rebellion against God. And yet, Jesus, you love me. And you love me enough that you allow me to come and to be in this place with you, to worship you. What a wonderful, wonderful day that'll be. Not only that, not only will you sing with a multitude and worship with a multitude of angels and ancestors, but also at that moment you will have stepped outside of time. In Isaiah 57, verse 15, it says, For this is what the high and exalted one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy. Now in that scripture, the word says, He who lives forever, talking about God and attributing that to God. Now, in the Hebrew, it reads just a little differently. It's translated, he who dwells in eternity. And what it's saying is that for this is what the high and exalted one said, he who dwells in eternity, whose name is holy. What does that mean? It means that God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Ancient of Days. He dwells in eternity. He dwells outside of time. God always was, always has been, and always will be. Now, we don't understand that because everything that we know has a beginning and has an end. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With, a, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And, 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 and Peter's not talking about, I don't believe, a literal thousand years. He's talking about that God's outside of time, that a thousand years is an eternity to God. You know, I mean, it's eternity. And so a day is like eternity to him. He, he dwells outside of time. He dwells in eternity. And like I said, we can't understand that. If a child came to you today and said, who created God? You'd say, no one. God created God. God's always been there. Wow. That child going to understand that? If he can... Tell them to come explain it to me because I don't understand it. Because everything we know has a beginning and has an end, but not eternity. Eternity never began, and it lasts forever. Now, God is the creator of time itself. Look what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now, if you'll read on later, you'll see God creates the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. But this is not what God was creating at this moment. Day one, God was creating time. He was creating evening, and he was creating morning, and that was the first day. You see, the very first act of God, by his very mouth, he created time, and he created space, and he created matter. And we have spent, ever since that time, studying about that, basically, right? About velocity, about time about space, about matter. And to us, on planet Earth, we still don't comprehend it. We just still don't understand time. We don't understand if time's circular or if time's, or if time's a straight line, you know? I'm sure maybe Einstein came a lot closer than most of us to understanding it. But to us, time always has a past, and it has a present, and it has a future. That's to us because we live inside of time. That's all we know. Time to us is much like a straight line with a past here, 
and a present here where we are now and a future that's ahead. Even though in the reality, there is no such thing as the present, is it? I mean, the present is like right now. And by the time I say right now, the present is now the past. And so we live in this, this time, not even really having a presence, but we know that we're flowing somewhere. We're moving somewhere. Now, God stands outside of all this. God is outside of time, and he's outside of space. C.S. Lewis was once asked the question, how in the world can God answer all these prayers or hear all the prayers of millions of people all over the earth at, at the same time, who are praying at the same time? And how can he attend to all of these needs? And C.S. Lewis put it this way in his book, Mere Christianity. A man said to me, uh, put it to me by saying, I believe in God, but I cannot swallow. But what I cannot swallow is the idea of him attending to several human beings who are all addressing him at the same time. What is really at the back of this difficulty is the idea of God having to fit too many things into one moment of time. Almost certainly God is not in time. His life does not consist of moments following one another. If a million people were praying to him at 1030 tonight, he need not listen to them all at one snippet, which we call 1030. You see, 1030 is always the present for him. For example, I write, Mary laid down her work. The next moment there came a knock on the door. For Mary, who has to live inside my imaginary time of my story, there's no interval between putting down the work and hearing the knock. But I, who am, the, who am Mary's maker, do not live in the imaginary time of my story. Between writing the first half of that sentence and the second, I might sit for three hours and think steadily about Mary. The hours I spent in doing so would not appear in Mary's time. They would not appear in the time inside the story at all. If you picture time as a straight line along which we have to travel, then you must picture God as the whole page on which the line is drawn. We come to the parts of the line one by one, and we have to leave. We have to leave A behind before we get to B, and we cannot reach C until we leave B behind. God, from above or outside of time, uh, uh, he sees it all at one moment. Now, if you could imagine a sheet of paper, and if I had a sheet of paper and I were to draw a line, a timeline on it, and I don't know where we fall in this generation on that timeline, I don't know if we fall toward the more toward the beginning or more toward the end of time, but time is a straight line for us, and we fall somewhere on that page. To God, he's above time, and he looks down and he sees everything. Everything in his, to him is always in what is called the eternal present. At least that's what C.S. Lewis calls it. In other words, God can see the past, and he can see the present, and he can see the future, and to him, it's always all in the present. Now, I like that. Whether or not that's a great explanation of time and how God is outside of time and dwelling in eternity, I don't know. It works for me. But what's beautiful about that is the moment that I receive Christ or I give my heart and my life to Christ, I commit myself to Christ, at that moment on my timeline, God sees that, and in the eternal present of God, he sees that, and at the same moment, if, you, if I can use that analogy, at the same moment, he sees Christ going to the cross and dying in my place. All that's happening in the mind of God instantaneously. Once again, I'm trying to make an illustration out of something that's so abstract I can't even begin to understand it. I can't even begin to fathom it. But when you die, you will step outside of time, at least time as we know it. And so this idea actually helps me with a lot of theology, with a lot of questions that people debate about the Bible. I mean, first of all, wouldn't it be very sad in heaven? What are we doing in heaven while people are still living on earth? You ever thought about that? Are we like hanging out in heaven waiting on Brother Johnny to get up there with us? Are we? 
What if when we step outside of time, all time ends, and Brother Johnny, even though he's living inside of time here, he's actually with us outside of time now because we're not in that time. We're in that eternal present. And so the beginning and the end has already happened with us once we step through the door of death. If this is confusing to you, forget it, okay? You don't have to get into this, but it helps me because it helps me to see that on the day that I die, basically, time has ended, that I'm now outside of time. And so that helps me at least form up my end days theology. And once again, there's going to be some of you who will adamantly disagree with me. And you're going to, you're going to throw scriptures at me, and you're going to say, that can't be true. Look at this scripture. Look at that scripture. So once again, I'm not here to argue or debate this with you. I'm just saying this helps me, and it may help some of you. You know, we have all kinds of people who go under certain titles when they talk about eschatology. And what's eschatology? Eschatology is basically the study of end time. And there are many who are premillennialists. I don't know what percentage are, but there are a lot of premillennialists. There are a lot of amillennialists, and there are a lot of postmillennialists. Probably more premillennialists around here than anything. And what does a premillennialist believe? Well, they believe that Jesus is going to come back and that the rapture is going to occur. And when the rapture occurs, he's go God is going to take out of planet Earth his chosen ones, the believers, and he's going to take them with him into heaven, and that's when the dead in Christ will rise. Now, the Bible seems to give mixed signals on that. Where are the dead in Christ before they rise from the grave? Are the dead in Christ in a holding place? Some people think so. Some people say the holding place is paradise, but they're not in heaven yet. Are, are the dead in Christ soul sleeping? I've heard that, which means that basically they're just sort of in an unconscious, frozen, spiritually frozen state until the end comes and then Christ comes back and he calls out the Christians. And when he does that, then the dead in Christ are going to wake up and they're going to come back. They're going to come from the dead. The graves are going to be rolled over and they're going to come out. And they're going to meet Jesus in the air with those who are raptured from planet earth well let's just suppose that there is no time and that when we die actually that is the rapture that is the when time ends please do not call me a heretic please do not do not think that i am uh, have lost my mind i'm not the only one who believes this <laughs> believe it or not Basically, this is our millennialism, which is when it ends, it ends. When time stops, we step outside of time and the world has come to an end. Or some may explain it more like when Jesus comes again, all time ends. But to me, in my mind, what I think is that once we step outside of time, we are now in the eternal presence of God and all time ends. The Bible says it this way, and this is a scripture that a lot of people use when they talk about eschatology or end times. They'll refer back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through verse 17. And Paul says here, he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, are you saying, Wade, that Jesus is not coming back? No, I'm not saying that. Jesus could come back today. Jesus could part the clouds today with a, with a trumpet call of God. I definitely believe that. 
I definitely believe that there will be some people that are raptured. That word meaning that they will be alive when the end times come and Jesus comes again. All I'm saying is the day we die, maybe that's happened. Maybe that is happening because we're outside of time and it, this rapture of being is not in a distant future. But yes, there will be people who will be taken up and meeting meet with Jesus in the air. Could it also be, just throwing it out there, could it also be that the day we die, that occurs because we're now outside of time? Once again, I'm not trying to ruin anybody's theology. I'm not. Still believe Jesus is coming back. Still believe Jesus will come back today. But I believe that we try to think the mind of God. And many times we're wrong. We are. We can't all be right. I mean, we can all be Christian, but we can't all be right when it comes to eschatology. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. I may be wrong. And if I am wrong, so what? But this kind of helps me. It also helps me when I think of the idea of predestination because there's a, a big debate, uh, and all, it has been for centuries, a debate between predestination and free will. Now, those who fall under predestination, some people call them Calvinists. A Calvinist believes, and this is very general because there's all kinds of views even of Calvinism, but basically that God does all the saving and that that what happens is you can't even come to Christ unless Christ calls you. I believe that. And that, uh, that we are in our sin, we are helpless and only God, our mind can't even comprehend God until he reveals himself to us. And you can't be saved anytime you want to only when God chooses you all that I can handle all that I believe. And it also, they also teach that, that, uh, some people, though, and this is where I would depart from hardcore Calvinists, that some people were created and predestined to go to hell. Now, on the other hand, there are free will. And some people may call these people Arminians. And, and what that is, is that man has a choice. That every person is accountable to God for the choice they make. Did they commit their lives to Christ? Did they choose Christ. Now what I find in the scriptures is both. I find both both views very easily. I find the Calvinistic view, which is predestination, that God preordains or he predestines man. You cannot read the book of Ephesians without at least coming across and having to debate in your heart and mind predestination. On the other hand, you see scriptures that says, whosoever believe in him, or if you will call upon Jesus, the name of the one and only begotten Son of God, you shall be saved, whosoever shall call. And so there seems to be in the scripture both. There seems to be in the scripture both predestination, and there seems to be in the scripture free will, or free choice. Now, let's suppose that even though both of those are in the scripture, suppose that we're stepping outside of time. You see, God already knows what choice we're going to make, right? Because he's in the eternal present. If God's in the eternal present and we make the choice to give our hearts and our lives to Christ, then at that moment, God already knew we were going to do that because he's in the eternal present. And so in that case then in a sense, we are predestined. We have to make that choice. For example, if I was omniscient and I knew everything, and if I was all powerful and I could do any, anything, and if I knew beyond a, if I knew that it was going to rain tomorrow, what has to happen if I'm all knowing, truly all knowing, what has to happen tomorrow? It has to rain. So if I know it, then it's got to be. It has to. It's inescapable. So therefore, I believe because we are outside of time, because God dwells in eternity, that God knows the choice you're going to make. It doesn't stop your choice. It doesn't stop man from choosing Christ or not choosing Christ. 
So I believe the Bible is written from two different perspectives. One perspective being that God, that God knows. God knows what choice you're going to make. And so it's written from that point of view. So it's written from God's point of view. Other parts of the Bible are not written from God's point of view. They're written from man's point of view. And man's point of view is that I choose. I choose to walk with God or I choose to walk away from God. Now, if you are completely confused, that's okay. Maybe some of these concepts are brand new to you. These are concepts that I've been thinking about for 40 years and debating and talking about. And it just helps me. Now, regardless of whether you're some sort of millennialist or you're a Calvinist or you're an Arminian, we can agree that we really don't know. Right? We really don't know. And there are smart folks who are on both sides of the fence. There are Christians who are both si on both sides of the fence. I understand that. I mean, there are brothers that I have that I love dearly that are more, much more hardcore Calvinists. They believe that. They are, there are people that, that I fellowship with every day and I love dearly that are premillennialists. They believe that the Antichrist is going to come and they're never going to have to go through any sort of suffering because Christ is going to rapture out the church and the judgment of God is going to come. And I understand all that. I mean, I relate to all that. I do. I've read a lot of the scriptures about that, and I've studied the book of Revelation, and I've been through Bible studies on eschatology and end times, so I understand that. But for me, this helps me. But regardless, I, I, I love you, brother, and I hope you still love me. You can think I'm crazy. A lot of people do that, you know, to think, think on, my friend. But the truth is, you're going to one day, if you're a born-again believer, you're going to have an eternal body. And you're going to step outside of time. You have to. Next is this. We are also conscious in our command and in command of our thinking and our feeling and our speech and our memories. So once we are in heaven, we will still be able to talk. We will still be able to think. We'll still be able to feel. And we'll still be able to speak. All these things will still be there. And we've read scriptures where people were talking in heaven. Uh, we've read scriptures where uh, Moses and Elijah met with Jesus and they were all talking and they were thinking and they were remembering. Uh, in Luke chapter 16, verse 25, I'm just going to read one verse. It says, but Abraham replied, and Abraham's in heaven at this time, and he's talking about the Lazarus is in heaven and the rich man is in hell in this story. And Abraham says this, he says, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Now, what's it saying? It's saying that here, in hell at least, the man had a memory. He could remember. I think that when we get to heaven, we're going to have the, the memory. We're going to be able to remember I don't think we'll have the shame and the guilt that we have because we'll understand. We'll understand why that God did that to us. And we'll be able to forgive him. We'll be able to walk in his shoes for the very first time. We'll be able to understand why he acted the way he acted. We'll also be able to understand why we acted the way we acted. And why we made such pitiful choices. And how come that, that you know, we'll be able to understand that, you know, a lot of times we blamed other people. When we started this snowball going downhill, when even though we blame them, hey, it can be traced right back to us. And we'll be able to forgive that brother or that sister in Christ because we will be able to understand why they did what they did and many times where we were at fault. And we'll be able to see both sides of the story because we'll have that enlightened mind and that higher consciousness than we've ever had. Also, the Bible teaches that once we get to heaven, there will be no more sorrow, no more suffering or tears, because we will be removed from the presence of sin. Now, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4 say this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, 
and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So what's it saying? It's saying there's going to come a day when there's going to be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. A lot of you are going through that right now. But the blessed hope of a child of God is that that day is not always going to last forever. As a matter of fact, what is going to last forever is a time where there will be no more death, where there will be no more mourning or crying or pain, for these things have now passed away. You see, we need to understand what salvation really is. A lot of times we think of salvation as an experience. We think of salvation as a one-time thing, you know? We think that once I was saved, then I'm always saved. Well, I understand that. And that's a Baptist kind of mantra, you know, once saved, always saved. And we sort of picture ourselves as we came to Christ, we committed our hearts and lives to Christ, and that day we were saved. But the word saved is in the past. Is that not true? E-D, the suffix is E-D, which is past. I was saved. But in the Greek, in the original language, that word is a present participle, which means this. It is a process. It is a um, not just a one-time experience, but it is ongoing. And so when we say we are being saved, it's like we are in the process of being saved. And there's not a real great English word that can translate this, this idea of the process of salvation. Now what that means is this, that salvation is something that is still happening with us even if 20 years ago is the time we gave our hearts and lives to Christ. What are you being saved from? You say you're saved, what are you saved from? You're saved from sin. I mean that's the idea, you're saved from sin. You're saved from anything unlike the character of God. Are you saved from sin? Are you there? Have you arrived? Are you are you perfect? Are you perfect? Are, do you have it all together, man? Are you just like God? No. No, you're, you're not just like Jesus. The Bible says in the book of uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, For all things work together for the good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. We stop there. But the next pass, the next verse says, For those called he predestined, to be conformed, there's that word, predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. In other words, you will be like Jesus. You're going to be, you're destined. It's, it's going to happen if you're a child of God. And God's working things in your life, both good and bad, at least in the way we perceive it. And through all these things that's coming on to you, the divorce, the sin, the choices, the consequences, the bad, and the good, and all the good that's coming. God's working in that for the good. All things work together for the good. But the good is not being happy. The good is not happily ever after. The good is said in verse 29. The good is you are being made more like Jesus because God is bringing these things into your life to refine you to discipline you and to make you more as much like Jesus in this lifetime as you can get. So salvation basically covers three ideas. Salvation covers the beginning. The beginning is called justification. Justification is being saved from the penalty of sin. The day the thief gave his heart and life to Christ while upon that cross, he was justified, just as if he had never sinned. That was the beginning. And when you give your heart and life to Christ, you are saved from the penalty of sin. You will no longer have to spend eternity in hell separated from God because you have now chosen to follow God and not reject God. And so justification is the beginning. Sanctification is the next part of salvation. Sanctification is the journey. That is the process and where the good and the bad things come in your life that as long as you live, you're being made more and more 
into the image of Christ. You're made to think more like Christ as you read the scriptures, as you go to church, as you are discipled. You're, you're made to think more like Christ. You're made to act more like Christ as the Holy Spirit uh, convicts you and disciplines you. Uh, throughout your life, the lifespan that you have, whatever amount of time that is, that is the sanctification process. So just, justification would be the beginning of the journey. Sanctification would be the journey. So justification is being saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is being saved from the power of sin. So you're no longer in bondage to old habits and old ways as Christ sets you free and begins that process of setting you free. Okay? That's sanctification. It is growing. It's a big word. It simply means growing in Christ, becoming more like Jesus. And then the third part of salvation is glorification. Glorification is the destination. That's when you arrive. You got there. It is when you become just like Jesus. You're not going to be glorified in this lifetime. You got to go through the door of death or through the rapture, man. But until you come into the presence of God, until you are in his presence, only at that moment in that twinkling of an eye will you, your body be glorified. And at that moment, you are saved from the very presence of sin. There's no sin anywhere in heaven. There's no sin there. And so justification is being saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification being saved from the power of sin. And glorification is being saved from the presence of sin. One way that I like to illustrate it is that I made a decision one day to go be a teacher. And so I decided to go be a teacher. And so I had to then, after that decision, I had to go to school, had to enroll in a college, I had to go through the coursework, and I had to learn and do what it took to get my teacher certificate. And so what happened was is that justification in the sense would be my decision to become a teacher. That's my journey. I mean, that's the beginning of my journey. Sanctification made me going to college, be me learning. Doing, getting the, uh, being equipped to do what I felt like I was called to do years ago. And then glorification would be the day I graduate or the day I get my first job or I get my teacher certificate in hand. It's when I've arrived, right? It's when I'm there. It's when I'm standing up in front of that classroom, basically, and I'm now teaching. So glorification is the final destination. And so what happens is salvation, as I said, is this process of God saving us from sin. You see, because it's sin that causes death, man. It's sin that causes mourning. It's sin that causes grief. It's sin that causes pain. But when we stand in the presence of God, all of this must flee because sin cannot stand in God's presence. Now, we're the bride of Christ, man. Jesus married us. And the Bible uses marriage as a picture of how we become one with Christ. Man, when we get to heaven, we are the church is considered the bride of Christ. And you are the church if you're a born-again believer. And so we are there because we are his bride. We are his church. And the Bible says that God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. And at that moment, God's going to wipe away all the tears from your eyes. That's gonna, there's not going to be any more sickness with you. There's not going to be any more death. There's not going to be any more sorrow. There's not going to be any more suffering. There's not going to be any more hang-ups. There's not going to be any more habits. You will be set free. Your spirit will be set free because you will be dwelling within life itself. For God is life. He is life himself. You will, you will never age. You will never die. You have arrived. You have drank from the living water, which is the only real fountain of youth. You will be living with the Creator, dwelling with Him. And the Creator will recreate us, in a sense, every day. You will be in the place you always wanted to be. And you will be, have become the person you always wish you could become. Suddenly, that scripture where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, 
And I am the life takes on all new meaning. Life. Life abundant. Life free. You can begin to have it in this lifetime when you commit your life to Christ. And as you grow in him through the sanctification process, you will begin to have more and more freedom as you are released from the power of sin. You know, the Bible talk, uses two words when it talks about life. It uses one word, the word bias, where we get the word biology from. And bias is physical life. And then the Bible uses another word which is called Zoe. Zoe is spiritual life. It is real life. It is life that really matters. It is also life that is eternal, that cannot be taken away from you. Every person that's ever lived has had bias, but only those who have been born again get Zoe. Zoe is eternal life. It is a life that only God can give you. It is a new spirit, a new life, a life that lasts eternal, a life that is the very life of God. It is what was breathed into Adam, and it's what will sustain you through eternity. Today, I hope that you've been encouraged. I hope that uh, I haven't confused you too much. I hope you're not mad, and I hope if I, if you can find a scripture to debate me and argue with me, that you don't send it to me and you don't argue with me. Because, like I said, in the end, the most important thing is we all get there, right? And I hope and pray that, uh, that you're encouraged, like I said, and that maybe you're made once again hopeful. Because a lot of times, man, when we focus only on this world, it's despairing. It's depressing. But the beautiful thing is we're only passing through. We're on a journey. We're on the journey to home. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we just thank you tonight, God, that we've had the opportunity to study your word together, together here, Lord, and just learn about uh, heaven, learn about eternity with you. And, Father, I pray for those tonight that may be discouraged. Maybe they've lost loved ones, God. But, Father, if their loved ones have trusted their hearts and their lives to you, then, Father, they, they're more alive than we are. And, God, I thank you for that hope that we have. Father, I pray if there's anyone within the sound of my voice who does not have the way, who does not have that eternal life that only you can give through Christ, Father, I pray that, God, tonight they will. I pray that, God, they, somewhere tonight that they will get on their knees and say, Jesus, I can't do this. I can't save myself. God, I can't be a better person. God, I'm not a good man. God, I need you to come into my heart and my life, and I need you to save me. I need you to work a miracle in my life and to change me, God, from the inside out. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in our life and in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you at Victory Baptist Church. We worship every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Um, we do have worship live. There in our building, we'd love for you to come out and join with us on Sunday. Uh, also, we'll be back here on Facebook uh, next Sunday morning. We don't have great internet, so unfortunately, we're not great at our live Facebook post. Usually later in the day, I update the message for that day, so it's a little better recording of the message. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us tonight, and I hope you have a very blessed week.